Thank you for joining us today on uh, the June Yeg Biz. And we're very fortunate today to have Ian Murray, who is the chair of the Edmonton Elks, uh, join us. Now, a little bit of a background about Ian. Ian was a graduate from the law school at the University of Alberta in 1984, where he received his Bachelor of Laws degree. But then he went on to Ivy School of Business, where he received his MBA in 1986. And Ian was, in, was uh, inducted into the, do you call it induction? Isn't it an, an induction? You're admitted, I think, to the bar in 1986. Admitted, I think. Law Society of Alberta, right? Ian's early work experience includes the law firm of Parley McLaws, the Acquisitions Department of Verity Corporation, and as an executive assistant to the Alberta Minister of Forestry, Lands, and Wildlife. Now, Ian has a vast interest in community activities and is the chairman of the board of directors of Edmonton Ellis, and we had mentioned that. And of course, that's the former Edmonton Eskimos, and we are going to be delving into that a little bit. We've had some changes in the organization in the last few years. He's also a director and founding president of the North Saskatchewan River Valley Conservation Society and is the chairman of the board of directors of Fairness Alberta. He previously served as director of the Environmental Law Center and the Edmonton Screen Industries Office. Ian recently retired from years of coaching kids ba uh, baseball and basketball teams. So he's heavily involved in the community in a number of ways and including having played for the Edmonton Huskies because he has a deep passion for football. So the Elk season tickets, the former Eskimo tickets, have been in the Murray family since 1952. So welcome, everybody, Ian Murray. Uh, Ian, the, the club has gone through a number of changes and issues and results, uh, especially in the last couple of years as a result of COVID. How has the business itself changed as a result? Well, COVID was obviously hard on everybody. Um, I think in, in the perspective of, uh, of the Elks, there'd be several things that happened. But, you know, first of all, you know, we had to be able to, you know, we had a, we missed a full season. Um, and then we had, we played a shortened season last year. So there were obviously some financial hits, particularly to do, to do with the first season that was missed. The company, the, the business actually reacted well in terms of having to adopt technology. Um, and, you know, the, the issues around workers working remotely went fine. That wasn't a problem. We, we did have issues last year when we started to get folks back into the stadium. And we, you know, on a very rushed basis, we had to implement a protocol um, with screening at the gates and at the same time, the same season ticket holders and casual ticket holders where they were living with a very you know, unique thing because at the same time we had to do the electronic ticketing. So the electronic ticketing was also being introduced. And so we ended up generally with a bunch of angry um, fans that didn't really like the idea that they had the COVID screening and the electronic ticketing all at the same time. And it was just kind of frankly too much for a lot of fans, particularly older fans. Um, so that I would say that would be sort of like a big deal that happened as a result of it. And also coming out of COVID, we, I think like a lot of other teams, there's a certain percentage of the fan base that's still cautious. So you still find some folks that are still worried about it and some fans that still don't show up um, because they're just still being careful. So I'd say in general, COVID stuff was, um, you know, had a lot of detrimental impacts to us. The, uh, one of the things I guess that, that's happened though is with the management change, you know, our new president's very technologically savvy. So he's building on a lot of the technology changes that were made during COVID and, and I guess technology perspective. It's a long answer to that question, but that generally what you were looking for on that one, Terry? Terry. That's good. That's good. And by the way, if you in the audience have questions for Ian, please put them in the chat box and uh, let's take a look at that. And you'll have an opportunity to ask it if you would like to. All right. So on the topic of continued changes, the Elks board had some difficult decisions to make at the end of 2021, which resulted in terminating three leadership positions. What precipitated that decision and how difficult was it to make? It was very difficult the, the three people that were terminated were all very hard workers and they were very dedicated. And in some, in some aspects, they had done a good, like a really good job. Like Chris Presson 
as an example, had done a very good job on the rollout of the new name. Like that rollout in June last year went really well with a very high percentage of acceptance. Um, but as the year went on last year, things were going badly and the business was having trouble from a sales perspective and from a reputational kind of branding perspective. And then ultimately it was decided that the skill sets that were appropriate before were not the right skill sets to basically do what, what had become a turnaround. So, so the, it had become a basically a turnaround requirement and, and we decided we had to you know, make the changes. And obviously the football um, performance, the operational performance on the field wasn't very well. We lost all of the home games, right? And, and so, so that was, you know, you know, largely the reason for the, for, for two of the three changes, but the, the change at the presidential level was just that we felt we needed somebody with more of a turnaround background. So turnaround, with experience to move it. so turnaround implies new strategy. And so the leadership changes theoretically should be able to bring in new strategy. Can you summarize what that strategy might be? And if so, how long do you think that strategy will take to yield results? Well, well the new president, um, Victor, he is extremely smart. Yeah, he's got a strong, strong background in sports management, you know, both from running the one championship business in Asia. And also before that, he was with ESPN and he knows the sports business very well. He gets the problem. Like we have a long-term issue in sports in North America around season ticket holder decline. It's not unique to us. It's not even unique to this league. It's, it's a general problem. So your revenue bases over time are gonna have to shift to more casual fans plus other revenue forms, more merchandise, more TV, and also maybe online um, revenue products. So Victor is fully aware of that challenge. And we're moving as fast as we can to, well, mitigate the problem with the season ticket holders while building up other revenue streams. So the aging fan base is something that plagues, I think, a lot of uh, sports teams, uh, not just the CFL. What do you think the future of that CFL league will be in the next three to five years, let alone the next 10 to 20? What will it look like? in that time period. No, the, but the aging fan base is, is, is a problem. But I, I, I think, you know, essentially we, we see the league as a whole doing a good job at, at working around that. Um, if you were if the game in Vancouver last week um, and some of the more recent experiences in Montreal, both the new ownership groups in, in BC and Montreal give me a reason for confidence that the problem in big centers can be overcome. Like, and I think we'll see over the next year or so um, that example that, the, that there is this theory that the CFL doesn't sell in big centers. I think we'll, you'll see that refuted. You know, there's still a problem in Toronto and maybe that'll take a bit longer, but certainly Vancouver and Montreal, I, I think you'll see that sort itself out. Um, and I think in general, the league will, have, will enter an area of considerable stability compared with, with its past. Like we, we won't have, you know, a bunch of problematic franchises, you know, Hamilton's raised equity recently and with a high value on the franchise, the Winnipeg, Saskatchewan, you know, stadiums are, are wonderful. Ottawa has done a great job with land redevelopment around their stadium. You know, so essentially it's actually looking pretty good, you know, going forward. So, you know, generally I think that from the league level, it, it's quite positive. I was uh, speaking with, this is uh, something I had a conversation with uh, Rob LaLusher, and of course Rob's uh, Rick LaLusher's uh, son, and uh, very, very uh, uh, aware of what is going on in all sorts of different markets. And he brought up the uh, topic of the Savannah Bananas. Have you heard of these guys? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a, uh, I, I don't know if Rob's online right now, but the Savannah Bananas has re -cha have changed the whole game of baseball to be more appealing to a younger fan base. Do you think that you that the CFL has to change the way they do things to be more appealing to a younger fan base? Okay, so um, the, the, there's two parts to that. A, a lot of what we see in polling is that the younger fan base want more action and they want less delays, which is uh, problematic for football and baseball. 
right? You know, that's why basketball, you know, has be had become more popular with the younger fan base. So, you know, we're going to try to do things to make stuff more interesting, speed stuff up, that sort of stuff. So we're aware of that. But, but the other problem is a lot of the, the um, fan base don't grow up knowing the rules and knowing the sport when they're young, right? Now, uh, you know, 50, 40 years ago, we all grew up with it. Everybody, you know, went there with their family. And what you do when you grow up with your family is sort of build a long time bond and you know the sport. We, we have to get back into the schools. So that's what we've done with the flag football process. So we got about a new thousand kids that are new every year. About half of them almost are girls in the junior high flag football program. And it's cutting across demographics and ethnic groups so that folks actually start to learn football. And we're finding that flag football program is one way of getting into the youth and their families early on. But it's a, you know, it's a five-year program to sort of gradually build that up. Let's, uh, and of course, that's one of the things that you will do to uh, build more fans, get more fans into the seats, right? Are there additional strategies you're deploying to do that, to get, that, get the uh, stadium filled to the, filled to the rafters? Yeah, so Victor would be better to give you more specifics, but he's he knows how to target specific groups on on online advertising and online materials. So he's got a, a marketing strategy that's more targeted, where he's going after demographics that he's that he knows how to target online um, and to push tailored messages, right? So not just one message for all, but tailored messages to go out. To different groups um, that he's so, so he's got a, a fairly sophisticated uh, knowledge of how to use social media for marketing. I don't. That's not me. So I'm. I would. You'd have to. He'd have to explain to you how he's doing it. Um, and it'll, and that'll take. You know, it'll take a while for it to work. But we think it. We're quite confident that. You know, there will be an impact um, as going forward. So uh, if you've got questions for Ian, please put them into the chat and we can take them one by one. So let's do that now. All right, so continuing on. Now, the, the board, you're the chair of the board. We've mentioned that a few times. And the board has had to get involved in a number of decisions in the past couple of years. How do you think the role of the board has changed from 30 years ago, 40 years ago to where you are today? And how will it look five years from now? Well, way back in the day, I think I, I think the board had less direct involvement, and it was much more informal. The processes are much more formal now. Even in the, my this is my seventh year, it's more formal now than it was when I joined. I probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have uh, succeeded to pass the screening criteria that's now in place as we pick new board members. It was a fairly you know it was a less formal process when I was asked to join. Um, so all those things are good. Um, but as it relates to the last few years, you know, the board had to get, roll up its sleeves and get involved in the, in the second half of last year. And then after we made the, the decision to replace certain management, all of the board members took on tasks and they did a great job during sort of an interim three months, you know, from say February, excuse me, from November to February. Um, and, and it was, so it was, it was activist during that period of time because we had a we had you know a gap before we hired a new president, um, but in general now it should drift back to being more of a governance type of board where it doesn't have to be as active day to day. And in fact, it, you know I don't have to talk. I don't actually you know talk to Victor every day. <laughs> like like I have no total confidence he can do his own thing. So. The, the board is, is, much, is moving back into being less interventionist at this point in time. So those three months must have been pretty scary. Somewhat well, scary. It, yeah, well, it was, and in the lead up to that, the board was, it's a very strong board with, with folks with strong business backgrounds. And, you know, the board was decisive. Like it was, you know, I, I've been told, I haven't done research, but I'm told it's the first time in, the history of the league that all three senior positions were terminated on the same day, right? So the, the board had to be decisive to, to make the change. And then we also had to do things a bit um, differently in that we had to hire the general manager and coach before we hired the president because we, were, we had a pending free agent 
you know, deadline. And if we didn't have a general manager in place, you know, almost immediately, you know, we were going to, you know, have a really rough time, you know, staffing the team. So we, we ended up, you know, setting up parallel tracks, you know, where we had one group uh, that I was coordinating with Wally Bono's support to do the general manager coach hire. And then our governance committee took on um, with the support of Gallagher, you know, and Lindsay Dodds, the chair of the governance committee on a separate track, they took charge of putting a process in place to hire the president. The first group was on a super tight time frame. We got it done by Christmas. And the second decision was made by the end of January, right? So, but in the middle of all that, we had to run stuff. So, you know, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of decision-making that had to happen on, on issues that we had to sort out, you know, that would be more operational that we had to sort out during the intro. So knowing that, knowing all of the uh, necessity for these board members to step up and carry a, a significant part of the workload, how would you recruit new board members in the next few years as the way you might have done it 10 years ago? And you weren't around 10 years ago. I don't think you were anyway, maybe, right? But what, what would be the difference in the recruiting strategy? You know, I think recently we've done a pretty good job. You know, we do sort of a gap analysis where we have a table and a skills matrix is like the proper name. And, and we use that when we go out and do the recruiting. And, you know, and it proved, I think, that the, the recruiting over the last while was, you know, well done because we, when we needed skills to deal with certain headaches over the course of the last, you know, particularly during that three month period, you know, we had the right talent, right? You know, we, we had folks with legal backgrounds that could support, you know, issues around negotiating severance agreements, right? We had, you know, folks with strong public relations backgrounds that could deal with the announcements and the, you know, some of the, you know, how we had to deal with some of the decisions and how we deal with some of what was going on in the background. And of course, you know, we were fortunate that the board, you know, we were able to access Alan Watt who was, um, went in as the interim operating officer and had decades of experience. But, but, but generally I think, you know, using an appropriate skills matrix, you know, works and you make sure you got a cross section of skills available. We got a question from uh, Chris McLeod. Chris, do you, would you like to uh, ask a question? Sure, if I get my, my mic and my camera moving. Um, Ian, great, great to see you. And you know, not just leadership on the with the Elks, but you know, across the community. And you, you played a huge role in landing the the massive, you know, one point three billion dollar hydrogen deal here with their product. So, you know, thanks on on many many levels, including you know the Elk stuff. So my comment is just, you know, you you talked about knowledge of the game as being one of the key pieces to get you know kids and younger people engaged. You know, we we brought people from around the world to. Uh, Oilers games, uh, looking forward to bringing them to Elk game, Elks games. Um, when we brought a group from Dubai to the Oilers, they, they'd never seen hockey, never seen any TV, never followed it. Uh, they were wowed, and they were wowed almost more by what was happening for kind of, you know, on the breaks than they were during the game. And I, you know, and it's a, certainly a different facility, but there's a kind of a lot to learn there. And I think the, you know, the bananas example that, uh, that, that Rob shared is, or that Kerry shared on Rob's behalf is another one. Like there's a lot of slow moving parts to a game now that there's so many, you know, TV and other things happening. Are you guys looking at ways to be more engaging when uh, there's breaks just to keep fans kind of, you know, on the edge of their seat all the time? Yeah, the answer is yes. And, and we, the, we, the, the, we've got the, the, the league level, there's the rollout of the Genius Sports, which is a database management company that help facilitate, you know, us becoming more sophisticated on reaching out to fans and having the right data and also to enable, you know, the new world of, of increased betting. You know, we know if, when the folks like get into the betting, they're more, they're keen as fans and they want more information all the time. And there's a lot of technologies that Genius Sports will help us roll out. So that'll be, you know, that'll be pretty leading edge stuff. And we're looking forward to that. It'll work well. Um, at the same time, we're moving away from a model in our minds that there's sort of like 10 games a year and, and you're sort of delivering to fans 10 times a year and rather trying to provide, you know, product and, and information every day. 
right? And so that's part of the mindset change that's taking place, you know, to go away from perceiving it as like, you know, a 10 event season and seeing it as an ongoing interaction with customers all year. And that, you know, you would have heard Victor speak to that, you know, so I'm just parroting him at this point in time, but that's the direction we see we're going. Yeah, sounds great. And I'll, I'll just add to that the, the work that Victor's doing on engaging with the community is absolute top notch. You know, I think it's, we need to feel like this is our community's team and, and Victor's kind of reigniting that. So congratulations on that. You know, he's good. Like, you know, the, we think we got the right guy, you know, we're quite confident in that. And we did want somebody with a skill set that could change the paradigm a bit so that we become less reliant on our traditional approaches. Uh, going along that line, I don't know if we've completely, uh, what is it, um, gone to the depth of this question, but what is the league doing, let alone the Elks, to g embrace this new generation of fan? And is this new generation of fan different from what would be in an American stadium? You know, that's a good question, if it's that much different. I think that the league, you know, the, again, the main initiative is the disagreement and investment by Genius Sports in the CFL, right? And, that, and a whole technology platform, it's going to, you know, that's gradually going to be introduced this year and next year. So you'll see, you won't really see this roll out till most primarily next season. Um, so that, so it's a big investment of time. There's also been a lot of marketing work on understanding the customer and targeting the customer you know, and, I, and I've seen you know, interesting stuff that describes different segments of customers, like one segment of what they call ballers, which is kind of a little bit of an analogy to the basketball fan type, you know, which is somebody that wants a lot of stuff more quickly and more interactive. Um, so, so I think that overall, it's going to be more sophisticated in how it approaches the fans. And we'll probably learn from some stuff that's happening in the U.S., but we may have to be a little smarter than them because our challenge, you know, is a little bit greater in that, you know, the NFL's obviously got a massive franchise and, you know, they can rely on TV revenues. You know, they can make money even without anybody in the stadium. Right. So, you know, we of course had to cancel a whole season because our business model wouldn't allow folks to, you know, survive without the, the folks in the stands. So it's, a, we have a different, we have at this point have a different, you know, financial model and reality. Yeah, the the uh, team is owned by the community. Effectively, that's correct, right? And of course, the other two options are to be owned by a corporation like a Molson's or by an individual like uh, like a Mr. Cates, right? What do you think the advantages are to being a community-owned franchise? Well, I think there's a big advantage if we manage it correctly. Right. So I think that there's a, a lot of goodwill and enthusiasm in the community for the tradition going back decades of, of the team. And, and over time, you know, if you look back over, a, you know, you pick 10 years, 20, 30 years, the three community teams, Edmonton, Saskatchewan and Winnipeg, have probably done better on average than the others. Right. And, and generally, the community owned teams have had had pretty solid governance and have had some pretty solid results, right? So, you know, we've, we're committed to it being a community team and to, you know, you know, having good management, but doing a better job of getting back into the community and making sure we try to build those roots, you know, from the schools up, right? So we do have to do that in order to, you know, maintain that bond with the community. So in the last couple of years, of course, one of the biggest changes that has happened is the rebranding from the Eskimos to the Elks. So give, give us some insight into what precipitated that change. Uh, it, of course, it's part of an overall cultural shift uh, across North America, right, to, to rebrand teams uh, for a variety of different reasons. Give us a little insight into what motivated the change to happen that quickly and what had uh, the results have been as a as a process of that objective well so i'll probably go in reverse chronological order um just because of my sometimes my brain works better that way but the 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 actual announcement of the new name 
that rollout was well done, right? We, we had, we, we were very happy with, with, the, with what was done at that point in time. And we think it all would have rolled smoothly if we hadn't proceeded to lose all of our home games and piss off all our fans with, with various other issues, right? But the, but the name issue itself, you know, that, that execution was good. And the, the, the process to pick the name was also thorough, okay? You know, we did a lot of research, you know, we hired a professional firm to support us. And, you know, so that, you know, we got to a place where we were confident at the board level that the right choice was being made. If you go further back in history, the whole controversy about whether the name change was appropriate or not, you know, we will never satisfy everybody on that topic, right? So, you know, last year when we had a lot of dissension, you know, I had to make a bunch of phone calls to, to season ticket holders that were upset. Um, you know, we would start with them being upset about, you know, electronic ticketing, for example, for five minutes. But within five minutes, the, the, that fan that was upset was almost inevitably upset about the name change. Like it was a, it was a, you know, well, and the fact we were losing. Like, but the, but it was at the heart of a lot of the animosity amongst the core percentage of the fans, and and so we we are realists about that. There's some percentage of the fans that, that I don't think will really get over the name change until we win a a Grey Cup. To be honest, like I think it's a, you know, that's the reality. Now the decision um, was complicated, and it was a multi-year process. You know, we had we had gone through a bunch of stakeholder engagement in the Inuit community. We had players up, you know, involved in discussions and engaging with the communities, primarily in the Northwest Territories. You know, I think Ryan King jumped in the Arctic Ocean. Like we went through a lot of that and, and we actually were at a place where, where we were confident that there was a pretty high level of support for the name, at least in the Northwest Territories. The polling did show the further we went to the East that the support waned. And the polling also did show that, that as you got to younger demographics, the support waned. But at the end of the day, we got to a point where it became an issue it was just gradually getting worse. And then when the Black Lives Matter, um, you know, momentum happened, it stimulated a lot of, of folks to push hard on our sponsors and the sponsors were also putting pressure on us. And at the, it became a, from a pure business perspective, clear that it was a problem that wasn't gonna go away. And there was also enough of that group that was upset that we weren't that we were at the stage of becoming less comfortable. Now, we were always comfortable that, that we were never doing anything that we consider disrespectful. And we were certainly not doing anything intentionally that we felt anybody would consider disrespectful. And, and the, within the Inuit community, we, you know, we did have a, a strong level of support, but ultimately a whole convergence of factors happened such that we became uncomfortable and we felt it was time to make the change. That's a very long rambling answer, but you know, that's kind of what happened. What is the result of that change? Have you seen something that uh, you weren't expecting or has it been exactly what you had intended? Well, well we don't have to deal with the issue anymore. So on the one, you know, so that, that, that distraction is gone, right? We, we still have a percentage of our fans unhappy, which is unfortunate. Over time, I think gradually that percentage becomes smaller. Um, we, we have some audiences happier with us. I think, I think it helps us with younger people, okay? So I do think it's an issue that does help with younger people. And, and it certainly helps us with certain sponsors, right? So, um, but, but, you know, the, the, the issue isn't without its problems still. Karen Wychuk has a question. Karen, go ahead. It's probably less of a question and, and just more of a comment. Like I, I would say to you that, um, you know, it's been amazing to watch the level of engagement of Victor as he has just 
you know, it's, it's barely a day that goes by now when you don't see something about the elk somewhere. And that's a really amazing new and exciting way of looking at the team. And, you know, I've watched the announcements from everything from, um, partnerships with Grant McEwen to, I know, I think Myron's on the line to EIA to listening to, you know, him engage on a leadership perspective from schools and, and just being present in the schools. And I think, you know, it's so fantastic to see that. I think the other thing, you know, that we always have to remember is that this is really a regional team, right? And, and I mean, I, I represent, I, I come to this forum uh, representing 13 municipalities from the region and, and we invited Victor to come and speak to all elected officials in the region back on May 13th. And, and a reminder that, you know, this region really supports this team. And I think, um, you know, that presence and, and taking advantage of, um, of being present with those partnerships, not just in Edmonton, but the surrounding communities, I think is just really important. Um, I do have a question. It was interesting the other day um, after, I think Victor was on uh, Ched after the loss in BC. And he made um, a comment that I thought was really great. First of all, I thought it was very classy the way he responded to um, just how BC rolled out their season home opener. And you know what he said uh, that evening, and I think it was to Reed Wilkins was, um, you know, this was good for the league. What BC was able to do on their home opener was really great for the league. And I and I my question to you would be, you know, what do you think are some specific challenges right now, or some things that the league has to do to really step up? Because when I think about uh, the challenges that that all of the teams have, there's really, you know, there's some things that I think the league has to come to terms with. And, you know, if there were two or three things that you could say would be difference makers right away that you think the league could do to, to just elevate the game and elevate the fan base, what would those be? So I have to be a bit careful because some <laughs> of the things that I might recommend, maybe, you know, things that we may have recommended and you know, are, are in the system at the CFL level and not yet, you know, with a consensus, right? So, um, but I think the, the, I think the idea of, of differentiating the Canadian product as, you know, faster and more exciting and having product, um, you know, we've moved the, the hash marks tighter to the middle and we have a bigger field, you know, you know there's a lot of things that allow us to potentially get to being, you know, a faster differentiated product, right? And so I think that is one that will help us over time if we gradually keep doing things to make the, the, the product itself faster and more exciting, right? So I think that's a big deal. Um, the, the, the other stuff, you know, so that's a product side. On the market side, it's really the stuff that's already started that I spoke about earlier where there has to be, you know, market marketing plans targeted to specific demographics and, and in a sophisticated manner to, to get other folks out. And that, that includes the younger fan. It also includes a more diverse set of fans that represent the population. Like I mean, you know, people always go back and say, well, you filled a place in 1985. Like, why can't you fill a place now, right? And in, in 1985, there wasn't a heck of a lot of competition. You know, we had blackouts for games, right? And, and you had, you know, a, a different base of fans that all basically knew the sport and grew up with it, right? Um, we have to get, we have to get into um, the communities and these other groups to get them. You know, people don't buy season tickets if they don't know the rules, right? Like that's just a sort of fundamental thing. So we have to get folks that, to do that. And, you know, I had one year where I went and coached the flag football team at the Crestwood junior high school, because my kid was there, right. And they didn't have a coach and a large percentage of the players on that flag football team were from Asia originally, like not, not now, but previous generation. Right. And they didn't think about, they were just like really good athletes, but once they got 
more engaged and learned the rules. They were really good players and they were good athletes. And when we had a, an event where we could all go, it was one game that the football team put on where the families could all, all got free tickets. And we, we probably had, you know, well, we had a large number of folks that, and the kids took their parents and the, those people had never seen a football game before, right? And, the, and their kid was able to play at halftime because we were one of the better teams. We were one of the ones that got picked to play at halftime. And we won. We had trick plays that worked. It was quite, quite a big, but we, you know, we got a bunch of new fans out, right? And, and we have to find a way to appeal to these fans from other communities. So anyway, that's, and that's a challenge, big deal. And in Vancouver, the new owner is, is really pushing that hard and doing very well, right? And um, that'll be part of the solution in the other, in Toronto and Montreal too. Rob well, Lowe, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thanks, Kieran. Um, I was just curious, Ian, with the FIFA announcement, um, if that changed any strategic plans for the teams, obviously there would have been great hope and talk for, for I imagine, great additions to the Commonwealth. So just uh, uh, curious to hear your thoughts on that. Well, we're going to have to put a longer term, you know, facility plan together working with the city, right? So we want to move the relationship with the city to be a bit more of a partnership relationship and a little bit less of a, you know, kind of a landlord tenant type relationship. And I think we have support to move it in that direction. So it's, you know, that whole facility planning issue is pretty high up on Victor's list of things to deal with this year. Um, because we, you know, we have to, we have a renewal coming up and we've had a couple of years where nobody paid attention to that stuff. Right. So some of the longer term planning stuff now is sort of ripe and being, and move forward. And it's clear that, yeah, like there would have been some capital money that the stadium would have received as part of FIFA that it may or may not receive now. Right. So we're just going to have to have those discussions with, with the city, you know, the, the stadium itself you know, does require some upgrades, right? It does, you know, it, it, it's not, it's got some natural disadvantages in that it's so far back because of the track, right? We can't, there's nothing we can do about that. But a lot of the other things we can work on, including the suites and, you know, the concession areas and just to make the place more, more fun and a little less sterile. So, you know, that, that's a piece of work Victor's got on his plate. So, Ian, you're a volunteer board. You're the chair of a volunteer board. And uh, it seems to be a lot of moving parts and a lot of heavy lifting on the board's part in the last couple of years. What advice would you have given yourself in 2019 to prepare yourself for all that heavy lifting in the ensuing couple of years? No, I, I don't know if I could have given myself any practical advice, but to be honest, because, you know, the, the day job was actually very busy through that period of time. And so other than, you know, like, and I'm not in a circumstance where I would suggest I can take time, too much time off the day job, but, you know, certainly the, you know, overall the, the work, the combined workload was heavy. I'm just happy that the talent at the board was as high as it was, right? Right. We had, we had folks like Kara Flynn and, and Craig Corbett and Brent Heshey and Tom Richards, and I'm not going to name everybody, but the, the group that jumped in that put the time in to support the efforts were made it not as painful as it might've otherwise been for me. So I'll just say that, you know, so, but I don't really think I could have done anything about it. Like I, you know, there's nothing I could have done in 2019 that, that would have all of a sudden created that less chaos. Okay, so if you've got questions for Ian, please put them in the chat and we'll take them one by one. Uh, Ian, I'm going to give you three wishes. I'm the magic genie. I'm going to give you three wishes, right? What would you wish for to help you make the next five years for the Elks a spectacular five years? What could the community do? What could institutions around you do? What could perhaps even some government entities do? What would be your three wishes? Well, I would say consistent with our efforts to be community-based and community-focused, we'd like all you folks to buy tickets. <laughs> and, and we'd like some more sponsorships. Like the sponsorship market's tight now, 
Um, we, you know, and it, we think it's a good, we offer a, a series of really good products. So we would like to see the community engagement pick up, but it's a reciprocal thing. It's partly us, you know, reaching out and doing everything we can, which is what Victor's doing. But we're also going to say, like, we would really like everybody, um, the folks out there, the folks on this call, you know, these tickets aren't that expensive. We'd like you to, you know, buy some tickets. We'd like, um, like you to look at some of our sponsorship opportunities that are really good. So I'd say, you know, wish one is to have a reciprocal community engagement where we get the business community increasingly engaged supporting the product. That'd be one. Um, the second one, I guess, is obvious. We have to win, right? So, and I'm Chris Jones is a very good coach and general manager. So we, we will turn that around. He, you know, he was very, the game last week was very competitive, despite the fact he had about a dozen injured players. Or, you know, we had traded out 11 starters from the week before, which is unprecedented. Um, so he will fix that. Um, but but we, if, when you get a winning momentum, that'll make a big, big difference, right? Um, and you mentioned governments, you know, I'm open-ended to anybody's creative idea on what we can do to have the governments get more supportive, right? So we, we did get some support from the provincial government during COVID, um, and all, obviously the federal government had, had wage-related supports during COVID too. Um, but we, if we can find ways to get the governments more interested and supportive, that'd be great. And we will need to have a real progressive relationship with the city of Edmonton going forward to work together to fix the stadium and, and modernize certain things. I don't know if that fits the bill. There's probably more than three, but close. Oh, we'll close. give you more than three. You get all the wishes you want. So no, that, those are the things I'd, so, but the, the first one with this audience is you guys need to buy some, all have to buy some tickets. So that'd be good. So Let's all buy good. some tickets. Rob LaLaSure. I was just curious, Ian, in addition to tickets and, and like the team's record itself, just how are you feeling about the corporate partnerships right now? And, and what do those opportunities look like going forward? Well, I'd say in general, it's positive. But I do know from talking to our, our people that it is a tight market now. OK, so coming out of COVID, you know, the, a lot of the corporate um, business community is tight with its money. So, you know, and how, how long it takes for a hundred dollar oil to filter down, you know, who knows, right? But but we but at this stage, you know, we it's not filtering down very quickly. So we would be very keen to see whatever support we can get because right now, you know, it is a very competitive market to go after sponsorship dollars. All right, let me see. I've got Sorry. some questions coming in here. One of the things I, I've noticed, uh, and you, you had mentioned this uh, a little earlier, Ian, I've noticed uh, in the hockey sphere, and certainly you're starting to do this as well, there seems to be a, a deliberate outreach uh, to uh, different audiences, like ethnic audiences, right? Uh, you see, and I forget what the hockey angle is. You, probably, you might know what the hockey angle is. You know, it's uh, hockey's for everyone, something like that, right? And... You've started doing this. What do you think the uptake of that has been so far? Are you seeing an uptick in audience participation from these communities? You know, I don't, I think it'll take a bit of time. Um, you know, I could throw out a few anecdotes, but it's not very sophisticated. I'd say gradually it has been improving, but it's just got a super long way to go, right? With like we, you know, I've seen the data on the, the makeup of our st our fans in general, and they all are older and they and they don't have a diverse background. So you know, we have to just do a whole bunch of stuff. And Victor started that, right? Like he's he's got a fairly aggressive outreach program, but but it's going to take a couple of years. All right, we got something from Javier. Javier, go ahead, Javier. Hi, Ian. Um, just wondering if there's been any conversation at the league level to start the season earlier, because I mean no matter what you do, you're going to have some very cold weather at the beginning or the end. But the end games tend to be a lot, or, or people want to attend the end games more because you're getting closer to playoffs and, and break up and everything. So has there been any conversation about that? Could we start the season 
March, April, so that we can finish in October instead of having to attend games in late November at minus 20. Yeah, so we, you know, I don't know how much it's moved ahead over the last 10 years, but it has moved, it has moved ahead, right? Probably about a, a month on average. Um, but the, uh, the, the, there is a push, right? And there's an ongoing dialogue to look at it because it's pretty clear that, that today's fan really doesn't like sitting out in the cold weather in, in November. But, you know, there are, but we have partners, you know, that the TV and, and other folks are, are part of that dialogue, right? So, it, but it is an active, an active point of discussion. And, you know, we already have bumped ourselves into, you know, now competing with the finals of the Stanley Cup playoffs, right? So we've sort of passed that threshold that's already happening, right? And, and I think um, there'll probably be more of that going forward. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it moves forward further. Shane Asbell. Oh, thanks, Therian. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, just curious, uh, any, any thought to scheduling a few more games during the week, like Thursday night or for the occasional Sunday? Yeah, so the, the bigger challenge with all of that is the, is the TSN you know, negotiations, and the TSN deal. And so we, the, the, there are Thursday games, right? Um, well, there's a problem with Thursday games once you get out of the summer because then kids you have a hard time getting kids because they have to go to school the next day, right? So you end up with this trade-off. If you have more, if you had more afternoon games on the weekends, you get more kids, but then you're competing with other things on the TV schedule, right? So it ends up being a fairly complicated discussion to to manage the different variables on that. Um, but it isn't just like the last question. It's something that's talked about for sure. We have a quick uh, question from the audience. Are there any plans to pursue the uh, Grey Cup here in Edmonton? There, there's a process for that where you you bid on Grey that they changed, The policy had changed um, several years ago. And when Edmonton was awarded it, in, I think it was 2018, you know, we were actually, the, that was the first year we actually bid on it. Um, and we haven't bid on it since. And there, at this stage, we haven't, you know, there's no, not an active discussion as to exactly when we will bid again, because we know some other cities want to you know, host it. Um, and there's a couple instances where the game has been promised, like Hamilton, because their great cup got partially, um, you know, negatively influenced by COVID, they were promised another one in 2023, right? So that date got blocked. And there, you know, so you end up with some complications like that. So the answer is to be determined, but obviously we're good at hosting Grey Cup games, right? And the, and the shared returns that everybody makes, you know, it's probably a good thing for the league when we host it because everybody makes more money, you know, than when it's hosted elsewhere. Um, but I don't have any news for you as to when the next time that would be. Okay. David Wickenberg. And thanks for joining us today. Um, yeah, just wondering which partnerships, marketing, strategic, or otherwise, uh, you're most excited about for this season. Well, I would say the, the most exciting change is the genius sports stuff that's going to gradually start rolling out, which will be you'll start to see, you know, influencing, you know, betting platforms and other stuff like that. And you'll see it more next year than this year, but it's the mo it's the main the major step change, right? I think that the, the second biggest step change in our market will be Victor's efforts, you know, to target different demographics and age classes and stuff, and market on social media and also the broader community engagement. You know, I'd say that'll be the the second sort of more significant change, you know, going forward. I don't have a any specific corporate you know, sponsor, I would, I would point out that's, that's bigger than the others, um, specifically. Here's a question from the audience. Um, what are your thoughts on the media coverage? You know, we've seen a significant shrinking of media. I think I just saw a note about Terry Jones last column as well. You know, after all those years, right? 45 plus years, something like that. Uh, what are your thoughts on the media coverage and the significant changes in that media landscape? Any comments on that? 
well, it kind of is what it is, right? Like, you, you know, you sort of accept that and you, you work around it, but yeah, but people aren't, you know, get their media a different way. You know, you, your phone, you hit the Google feed and it, it sends you what, what you want, right? Um, you know, it's, it's machine learning and it figures out if you read three down nation, then you get three down nation all the time automatically. Um, but, but we don't all sit there and read the Edmonton journal. So, you know, we, we just live with that reality and our marketing has to be handled accordingly. But, you know, clearly the, the, the lack of journalists, you know, over time, you know, isn't helpful, but, but you know, we, we just have to, you know, work, work through that. And Terry Jones, you know, did a good job for us, right? Like Terry Jones was a, you know, every once in a while he would, you know, crap on us if we did something stupid. But, you know, he was a, a loyal fan and was also a provider of good counsel and advice from time to time, right? So, you know, he, he not being in that role, well, he'll be missed. Larry Jenkinson. Hi there. Uh, first, thank you, Kirian, for uh, YEG Business Leaders for putting this on. Ian, great presentation. I just want to give a shout out. I haven't been to an Elks game in probably five years. Uh, or actually since the Grey Cup on Sunday, I did some hosting at a field level tent uh, with uh, three business colleagues. And uh, it was an amazing time and everything prior to the game was amazing. And uh, I would encourage everybody out there to just give it a try. Thank you, Larry, good job. And, and just folks, we, you know, we are trying to make it more exciting before the game, right? So. You know, the tailgating is bigger than it used to be, and there's a band playing, and there's just stuff to make everything more interesting. So it's more of an event. So you should come early because there's more fun stuff to do, you know, before the game starts. And then after the game, you know, the kids all can go out on the field and run around, and the fireworks are pretty good after the game as well. Really, really good. Okay, let's take a look around. We're well past the hour, Mark. Uh, are there any other questions for Ian from the audience? Here we go. Javier again. Javier, go ahead. This is just oh, more of a, of a thank you uh, to, to the Elks. Like we uh, at Kids Up Front, we've partnered with the, with the organization for years and we've been able to send, uh, I would say, hundreds of thousands of families, uh, kids and everything to enjoy the game, have some, spend some quality time together over there, uh, meet the players, just, just learn a little bit more about sports and everything. So really thank you for all that work, Ian. Well, thank you. Well, it's your big target audience for us. We need to get those folks to learn the sport. Thanks, Javier. Fred Richardson. Just get my video center. going. <laughs> um, there you go. Years ago, the back to school game against Calgary, which was the uh, the return game from the Labor Day game, used to be just about full stadium. Is there any thought to going back to that uh, format? So I'm going to leave that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to precisely answer your question because I know Victor has got a very specific, you know, rollout strategy for each of the games. Right. And, and so I don't want to steal his thunder in terms of what his plan is. Um, but we're, everybody's, you know, aware of the fact that the, the allure of that game, that was largely because, you know, tons of tickets were given to the schools, right. Just, which is a good thing, but um, that's a, you know, I'm going to let, I'm going to leave that to Victor because the operationally is, you know, rolling out a plan for each game. Okay. Sorry to, sorry to dodge a bit, but gonna, you I'm know, I don't, you know, I don't want to get myself into trouble here. <laughs> All right. I don't see any more hands up right now. So with that, uh, I'm going to leave it uh, to you, Ian. Uh, are there any parting comments before we sign off? Well, you know, I, I, you know, when you asked for my three wishes, I kind of said already, but, you, you know, I do think it's a reciprocal where we do need the community support. And we're going to work really, really hard to be in the community and, and improve the bonds. And, you know, it's a priority, obviously, for the team to do that, because that's, you know, where we're going to get the long term loyalty with the fans if we start when they're kids and get the families involved. Um, but we're really open to whatever you folks can do. And, you know, it's organizations like this that are networking organizations that there may be programs you folks can put together or whatever you can do. 
but I see this as like this, this sort of five-year turnaround and I'd be really cool if it only took three years. So, you know, whatever can be done to speed this process up, you know, I'd be fully in favor of. And, you know, we're making that we've got the right people, we've got the right plan, you know, moving forward. And I just like, you know, whatever we can do to speed up the execution would be great. And so we're open to your ideas as well. Okay, okay. really good. Ian Murray, Edmonton Elks, thank you for joining us today.